Hello, Internet. I'm excited today, even though it's nighttime here. Yeah, that's why the lights look so strange to me. I don't have some kind of a illness. I look like this, really. Um, white. That's the lights in the studio. But anyway, I'm very excited because we have the seven medical Italian doctor here with us. His older brother was actually on the show, uh, Duplessis, or as my wife would say, well, I'm not going to say that in French because I will sort of attack the language. He's the younger one of his sons, I believe there's another one as well, but he's also a medical doctor, Charles Duplessis. Doctor, very welcome Yeah, Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, may I ask you, how did this happen to you? Did you uh, first qualify as a doctor and then got called off? Or what happened to you? Yes, Chris, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to be here um, and tell my my story, which, like I said, compared to some other guys, might not be as impressive. But anyway, um, I'll do my best to keep everybody entertained. Um, yeah, well, it's an interesting question. Um, look, obviously, as an older brother, you know, always look, uh, as the younger brother, always look up look up at the older brother and, you know, he's he's done all these things and um, and then sort of by the end of my school years in 86, um, I was always keen to go to the army. And uh, I think things were things were ramping up a little bit in Angola at the time. And my parents were getting very nervous uh, about me going to the army. And uh, they sort of kept mustering me towards university first and um, and not knowing what's obviously what's going to happen. And, and it didn't, it's pretty much, Close to to the end of my school years, it it, it was sort of all over, um, you know, in a way. And um, so I always had that interest. I, that that was in my mind. That's what I want to do. And um, so in a way, I was disappointed. But anyway, so we went to university and um, didn't get into to med school straight away. I was in school. I, there's much more important things than academics. You know, there's rugby and. Um, everything else, and you know, too young to drink. So it was, it was, yeah. So all good things, all good distractions, you know. And um, anyway, so I started with a Bachelor of Science degree. I sort of um, joined in. Uh, I went to Indrach, which is a uh, one of the, the hostels of Corsais at Stellenbosch, and um, and I remember the army blokes, uh, all the guys that 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 finished their military service that was sort of in the same year. I always gravitated towards these guys because I always had this um, curiosity and, um, yeah, and always, you know, I wanted to listen to their stories. And so that 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 sort of regret was always there. And um, and as time goes on, you know, eventually got into med school and, um, you know, student life gets in the way and, and it's a it's a long course. And, and I saw, I think that sort of passion started fading away and, you know, a lot of other things, academics and like that student life. Um, being a long course, I definitely pushed the limits on that. You know, I definitely made the most of a long a long course. And um, so, uh, so, but anyway, I pulled it through. <laughs> I finally finally got my degree. And, um, and then in my internship here, I went to a small uh, hospital uh, outside of Cape Town, about 100 guys in... Um, North of Cape Town is called Booster, and um, and Booster was and it was it was full on. It was it was great, a great experience as a as a junior doctor. You you um you, you see so much. You get the opportunity. You know, I, I work and live in in um, out in, in Australia now, and I can't um I, I can't imagine um how these guys go without such intense training that we had the opportunity to, to experience in South Africa. So I had trauma experience and surgical experience and things coming out of my ears after that 12 months. And um, wasn't really sure what I was going to do afterwards. And, you know, you might start talking about, yeah, let's all go to Europe and make some money and start paying some student loan back. And one day I opened the mailbox and there was a pamphlet. You want to jump out of airplanes and abseil and, and all these things. And I'm like, yep, that's me. And uh, so I knew exactly what it was. And uh, so I applied and I thought, oh, let's see what happened. And um, not thinking, yeah, sort of look at a look at myself in the mirror and thinking, geez, it's been a while since playing rugby. It's been academics and work. So I'm not 
in the best shape I was in my life. But anyway, I thought, oh, let's see what you know, what happens from this. And um, yeah, so I got a reply back and they said, yep, we'll put you on a plane. You're going to Pretoria and for an interview and some um, psychometric testing and things like that. So, uh, so I rocked up there with a, a bunch of doctors and uh, anything from ponytails to, to um, funny beards and, and earrings and stuff like that. And, and I thought, geez, and I could see those guys were rubbing their hands together. I couldn't wait to, to get stuck into these guys. But um, anyway, so, and they said, bring some PT clothes. And um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the days I almost died um, because I wasn't. <laughs> so, well, anyway, they put us through the paces. And, and, and I, look, I realized, um, yeah, that it was more of a, um, a test to see if you train a bull. And um, and that with the psychometric testing, I got. And then a couple of weeks after, I got the call up and said, "Yep, first um, of January, you you clocking in uh, at Sevamed." And um, anyway, so there were five of us, um, five doctors, and um, yeah, we started our our journey of basic training. Couldn't wear any rank, which is fine. Uh, a car work on it, obviously, or candidate officer, and um, but anyway, so. The one doctor, he, he lasted about two weeks. And uh, I think he was. He said, man, I can't take this guy standing in front of me screaming in my face. And I thought, that's the least of the problem. You know? It's like, I chose to be here. And uh, anyway, um, so shortly in, into the journey, we were four left. And, um, and I, I can truly say, as tough as it was, um, you know, Physically, getting getting fitter and fitter, and 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 I take my hat off for these guys. You know, some days you think if you find them in a dark alley, you're gonna you, your PTR, you're gonna you're gonna strangle him. But um, but anyway, it's uh, if it wasn't for him, you know, there's a purpose behind it. Now, these guys have to get us over the line. There's nothing more embarrassing for a seven med candidate to to go get his wings from um, in bloom, and they come back and say, no, sorry, come back next year, and so. So the sediment guys were were adamant that you know if 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 you're gonna if you're gonna go we expect you to to make it and um, anyway so yeah so basic training we had a, like I said I, I had a great time as tough as it was it was amazing um, I can only uh, I've only got fond memories of it to be honest um, probably my highlight was um, on the um, outside of um, Varan. Went there for some basic bush training, and and then the day we had to shoot for our for our badge or the bulky, and um, I thought, great, this 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 is this is what I like. You know, I grew I grew up. My dad's a great shot, and we went hunting from when we were kids, and shooting was a big part of our life since I was young. And um, so I thought, yeah, no. and um, so that our PTI or the the, the sergeant he. he yeah, he was on my case because I said, you know, I wanted to check out the, the R5 and I, and I was checking the sights and everything. It says, so typical thing. And I was like, what do you know about, about rifles? You know, and um, anyway, so I just wanted to make, check the sights all you know, yeah, nice and um, secure and all these things. And I asked if I can take a few practice shots just to see where sort of it's, it shoots and everything. And anyways, so then it was on, he was on my case, but um you know, the running from the 400 to the 300, to, I can't remember all these steps. But anyway, it was one of the stages, you know, it's against time. You've got 60 seconds. So you can either sprint it um, or you can jog it, but then you've got less time to shoot the target. And um, and I remember one of the, the the I think it was the um, kneeling on the 300 or something like that, uh, or the 200, I can't remember. Anyway, i supposed to have 10 shots. And I, and I remember, I was like, hang on. There's only nine shots. So afterwards, I said to him, "Mate, I only had nine rounds." He said, "No, nah, we definitely it's it's ten ten rounds because you take your ball suit and you walk up to them and they put they count and they put the rounds and you go back and load your magazine, etc." And um, anyway, and that exercise that, that specific section was done. And if as I picked up my 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 ball suit, there was the round in the fold, so I missed it. So it was my mistake. And he's like, "Yeah," and and, and it gave him so much pleasure because you know I, I missed that shot. And um, and then one of the uh, an, another time there was the one with the five showings. You get two shots per showing, and and I had a and on the first showing, uh, I I took a shot and and I had a stuer. I don't know what's it. it um, so I had to 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 cock it again, and it cocked out the round. 
and uh, by then it was yeah then it was catch up after that so and um, anyway so so he he thoroughly enjoyed that as well and um and, until the score came out and that was the only two shots that I missed <laughs> and <laughs> so so then he was a bit a bit annoyed and you could see uh, you know, some of the other sergeants that that's a bit more the, the kind of the kind of guys and uh, that's why they're probably not the PTI. They they sort of there's part of the instructors, but they're not as harsh as this guy. You could see them sort of having a bit of a a, a good moment as well. And um, so he said, "Okay, so now you think you a hot shot, eh? Um, so I'll I'll take you on on the nine mil." He says, "Come over this side." And I said to him, "Look, I've been shooting rifles since I was a kid. But I've got no idea about my nine mils." But anyway, he was adamant, and I said, "Okay, well let's let's give it a crack." And um, so he was quick, quick then to put a bottle of rum on it, and um, so a bottle of red eye it was, and uh, and needless to say, I kicked his ass. <laughs> so I think until today, um, yeah, every every time we sort of make contact or we catch up as as, as an old boys club or something, you know, I'll 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 make sure to to bring that up, and uh, because that was the the hardest bottle of rum he ever had to give away, <laughs> but. Um, Look, on, on many occasions he got me back by uh, by pure blood, sweat, and tears. But um, but anyway, uh, doesn't matter. All I have to think about that that one bottle of rum that I got off of him at one time. <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, so the the the, uh, the the we went through um, the second bush and, and, and advanced uh, foreign uh, foreign weapons and training and and another probably memorable story was. Um, at one stage, we were in Madimbu, you know, Fort Scorpio. Uh, and um, anyway, so as part of the exercise, this one major and myself, we had to give orders and we had to take the guys through a route march throughout, a route march throughout the night and then get to this um, this old mine, which is now, it's going to be a, a live fire movement exercise. And um, and before the fire movement exercise, then the artillery guys will shoot some mortars over our head to soften up the target and then it's you know, smoke grenades and the lot. Like, like a, uh, anyway, great exercise. So we marched through the whole night and things were yeah, great and, and um, no GPS. It's all uh, map stuff way back then still. And um, but anyway, so we got to the point and and because it's a first light attack, the, the artillery guys were getting a bit um, edgy and they they just wanted to go. And we said like, look, hang on. We just want to make sure we're in a good spot. So I actually went with this. Um, sergeant the, the pti anyway so we walked forward because we don't want to be too close um and we don't want to be too far so you don't get that experience from the mods coming over there you have to be in a, in a good sweet spot anyway walk forward and um and sort of check it out so yep no, we can probably bring the troops about 100 say 100 yards forward and um so i turned around and i was on the radio and speaking to the artillery and said look um five mics at the most and then they can I thought, well, we'll have more than enough time to bring the guys forward. Anyway, and, and as I'm on the radio, I could see the guy go down tying his boot, the sergeant. And when I was, oh, and I, uh, the moment I'm off the radio, I turn around and he's gone. And uh, now you can't go say, oh, in a shout. It's, it's still a clandestine uh, exercise. So you can't go and scream and, and, and shout his name and stuff. So anyway, so I, I gave a bit of a whistle and I could hear him whistle. And I thought, I'm not definitely not getting back on the radio to, to, to sort of say, oh, sorry, can you give us another five minutes? Anyway, so, and I, and I whistled, so he whistled, I whistled, he whistled. So I started, by then I was running flat out. It was slightly uphill and I was running flat out towards him. And I go, and, and, I, and nothing. And I whistled nothing. And I thought, well, that's why I last heard him. I was going to keep running in that direction. And um, next moment, I swear, I just saw this shadow because you, the, you could just start seeing the tops of the trees. Next moment, I just see this big shadow. Here's this elephant standing there. And by then, I'm running flat out. And, and as I'm hitting the brakes and I'm sliding over the ground, obviously, this big noise. And uh, and this thing got startled. And he, he swung around. He just went. And and I turned around. And now I'm running the opposite way. And um, and normally, the elephants, you know, they, they would flap their ears and give a bit of a a bit of a charge and they'll turn and go and um anyway so i'm running flat out away from this thing but i could hear the doof, doof, doof. and as i'm ducking under a tree i can I'm, I, I'm i'm sort of in your head you know um time slows down 
and um, I'm running a duck crack, duck crack, and I can hear that gap's getting shorter because, of course, you can't outrun an elephant. And I thought, this bloody thing's not stopping, and uh, I'm going to have to make a plan at some stage. Just don't trip over and fall because it's like in the movies, you know, fall over and then it's all done. But <laughs> anyway, and there was, and I got to this little dry riverbed at, at the bottom of this um, decline I was running, probably about two, three meters wide. It's a dry riverbed, luckily with sand in it. And I thought, I can clear this. If, if, if I give it a good jump, I, I can clear it. But if I hit the other side, I'm going to be winded and then then it's, then it's I'm stuck. And uh, so uh, just that last minute decision, I just went head straight into it and I rolled to the side and I and I sort of crawled up on the, on the, on the edge. Now I'm lying on my back, looking at the grass, sort of over, overhanging the edge of, of, of the riverbank. And I could see the elephant there. So he stopped. So he couldn't see me. I was I literally maybe two, three meters to his right at the bottom there. And he was standing there and he was just smelling with his, his trunk. And uh, and the guys on the radio, uh, uh, you know, next moment they say, what the fuck is happening? And I was like, uh, just trying to get the radio. I, I forgot to mute the radio. And um, anyway, luckily the thing turned around and he walked off. And... Uh, and so the reason was that the sergeant stopped because he was worsening. He was walking, and then he saw the elephant. Obviously, just stood still, and I was running on the, from the other side. So the elephant was basically between the two of us. And um, anyway, everything with the rest of the morning went without a hitch, luckily. Um, and um, well, for interest sake, that elephant. A uh, couple of weeks later, there's uh, yeah some some uh, one of them phases the the bush ambulance. The, the, in the same area. So this lone bull, he tried to push over one of them fezzies. Uh, obviously, didn't succeed. It's an 18-ton vehicle. and But, um, yeah, so he was not a happy chap in that end. So maybe a sore tooth or something. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, yeah, so that's probably my, uh, from the training side of things, um, building up towards going to Tempe to get the, get your wings. Um the, two of the other doctors got injured. The one got shin splints and the other one, um, ITB issues. So it was um, two of us left, uh, Johan Nell and myself. And uh, I remember running one morning, you're running there. And, and, and by, by then, sort of, it's probably about May or June. Um, we're, uh, the, the, they sort of let us have a run in the morning ourselves before we do uh, BT at the base. And um, we were running and, and Johan still said, geez, you know, He's not so sure whether we've done the right thing. I said, what do you mean, Johan? He says, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost six months in and we've done no medicine. I said, exactly. <laughs> I said, man, this is the best gap here you can think of. And he says, no, oh, but, you know, all our friends, you know, they went to Europe and these guys are making money and, you know, it's, it's you know, how are we going to pay back all the student loans, etc." And I said to him, Johan, <clears throat> one day when we're old, no money in the world can buy back these experiences we're going to get. And, um, and he sort of had a good think about it, and 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 he and then he he sort of saw it just in in a different angle, and he's like, you know what, Yaron said right, and um, yeah. So long story short, the two of us went to um, went to Bloom for our, um, jump course, and um, a group that arrived rocked up there. We we're only two from seven mate. The rest were all different um, guys from from um, uh, from the reconnaissance units and all over. Um, and from the 370 that started and the, and the big group, you know, obviously they, the big culling session takes place in the first few days and um, long story short, seven, there's 15 of us on that photo. And, um, and that's, uh, yeah. And that, again, that was a, a, a great experience. You know, I've, I've learned a lot about, and I still apply it um, in so many things in my life, you know, that we, we had this, the, the group became quite tight and we had this this um this this sweater and then and put a logo on it you know with the the um the parachute and, and the logo was and it's 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 not my quote we we've one of the guys found it and said hey do we put this one on and it says that the character of a man is determined by the obstacle he takes to stop him and and i and like i said and that's true. You know, there's so many times in life you get to an obstacle, some form of obstacle in life. It doesn't matter what it is. And 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 I always thought back about those things. I said, okay, is this the thing that's going to make me say, uh, stop me what I'm planning to do? Yes or no? 
And um, so, yeah, anyway, so that was, um, yeah, that's what one of my, my fond memories from, from that time as well. Like I said, the jump course, it was, <laughs> I, I'm not a small guy. I'm six foot five and, and probably the biggest guy there. And um, so they learned their lesson when we finally started the, the real jumping. And um, so they, they, they chucked me out last in the stick and, and I almost um, fell, uh, almost killed two other guys in the process going past passing them. <laughs> so since then, I was the first guy to jump out, which comes with his own problems sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, I was, I was happy to jump out first and uh, not land on anybody else. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll pay one day with, a, you know, with all the joints because yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big impact on the joints. But anyway, I had a great time. And um, so, yeah, so once we finished our cycle um, through 7 Med, then you get permanently detached. And um, so Johan, the other doctor, he um, he decided to go to the Pathfinders because uh, he wanted to be in Bloemfontein because in a few years, you know, from there, he wanted to specialize um, in Bloom and um, in, in surgery of some sorts. And Bloom was uh, known for the medical school with a really good surg surgical department. Um, um, I could choose where I wanted to go. Um, I decided, you know, the bush is what I like. And, um, so I chose to go to Palaborva, went to, um, five special forces there, like permitted to attach there. And, um, one of the other doctors that he did everything except for the jump course, uh, he didn't get his wings, but anyway, he, uh, he has family in Cape Town. So he went to, um, to Langebaan and, um, they just said he must do his jump course in, in years to come. And um, so, yeah. So it, it's um, like I said, it was I was welcomed in 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 five um, unit. Very, yeah, it was it was great guys. You know, it was I was quickly welcomed within the unit. Although we um, our cycles, um, I think in the in the in the old uh, older days, you, the the seven mate guys used to do the cycle with um, the reconnaissance unit. Then it sort of got split up and sort of just run parallel. But anyway. Um, made some great friends there and um, learned some Portuguese because half the unit was Portuguese by then and um, not by then it was actually probably one of the first integrated units um, throughout history and uh, so a lot of the um, ex-Angolan or African child soldiers or, or the guys that, that sort of um, fled over the years often ended up there and um, learned a lot from from those guys, although the war was over, you know that this guy. This I remember getting lectures from from one of the guys there on on, on weapons and stuff, and and everything is in his head. He can't read or write, but um, he knows everything. It's um and you know and the amount of contacts and and uh, yeah he, that this guy has been through and and it's amazing. Yeah, so I met really amazing people there, which um yeah still friends with some some of the some of them. And um, a lot of them eventually left the military over the years. It's um, for for you know sometimes for financial reasons to go make some money in the in the private sector, and um, that was sort of a trend that happened um, in the in late nineties, early two thousand. Probably still happening. And um, we had some interesting deployments though um, with. Uh, at five, the, one of one of the memorable ones were um, going to the DRC. Um, we flew to um, to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and we we're based at the airport there. Basically, the um, ninety look. There's always uh, a very complex conflict happening in the DRC, um, with multiple countries always involved on the fringes of that. You know, between. Um, Rwanda and uh, even Angola. So there's, uh, with the DRC, there's always conflict in um, Kabila at the time. They were pro and uh, against Kabila um, supporters. So um, there was a lot of Tanzanian officers. I won't go into detail that that's really complex time where, where um, South Africa, um, that, well, they were pro Kabila guys and, um, and a lot of the, the, the countries actually sent troops there. Um, Mandela played the safeguard, saying, no, there's a better way of um, resolving issues. And they pretty much 14 months post uh, uh, um, uh, civil war, and um, and then it sort of just flared up again. And um, anyway, so 
um, yeah, Mandela didn't send South Africa didn't send any forces to to go fight in in the DRC. Um, uh, Mandela did the right thing, saying, "Oh, as part of the SADC countries, you know, there's, 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 there must be a better sol- uh, resolution to to, to solve things." Um, but unfortunately, there was a lot of tension because there's some private contractors in South Africa. <laughs> Um, contractors, different ones already um, involved there um, from different sites. And um, so, you know, on, on the ground there, so we weren't necessarily um, in favour. But um, anyway, but the purpose of the deployment was to to um, to go extract the Tanzanian officers that did training for the Congolese um, soldiers in, um, in in a, in a one corner, the, the south south southeast corner um of of the congo and um so and tanzania said well it's nothing to do with us we want all our officers out and we um we, we unable to do that and um so we went and unmarked planes and civilian clothes all our kit was in uh, we, we had all our kit and, and stuff in the plane but um we sort of just worked shifts and worked uh, pretty much 72 hours straight we just worked shifts we flying in and out and Sort of getting these guys out, and it was quite tense on the ground. Like I said, we weren't very liked uh, for multiple reasons. You know, these guys are because not only that we're from South Africa and they they're uncertain on 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 our intentions, but also we're taking away um, a lot of the 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 the, so, the the officers that's that's been supporting and training these guys, and sort of um, yeah. So I can uh, so it was. Sort of a tense time, but anyway, nothing bad happened really. It was a successful um, operation. We got all the guys out without a hitch, and um, and then pretty much um, shortly after being back from that, I think it was then the the Lesotho conflict happened, and um, so we were told, right, boys, um, going to Lesotho, and um, by then. Um, um, the, the the unit had already guys sitting in in shabins there drinking getting um information and um so we we knew that the, the, it was obviously bring up in, into a coup between the the military and the police and the government and um so the idea was to 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 de-arm the military and sort of do a bit of retraining and integrate with them and then sort of just let the dust settle and go back home and um, so that was that was the the summarized message, really. But um, but as um, Mayor Jojo Brains and Colonel Doiby could see it, he was the uh, Doiby could see was the the um, officer in command at the time, and uh, Mayor Jojo Brains was was sort of giving orders, and um, he just said, "Look, there's nothing like a it it never works out the way you think it's going to work out." And um, so we did. Um, a three-day training exercise with um, 12 um, Flarmeister, which is a small vehicle that a four four vehicle takes about 12 guys anyway. And um, so, and look, there was there was a, a lot of excitement um, within the unit because a lot of these these guys, like I said, they haven't done anything for ages, and um, so a lot of them were were itching to to go and do something. And and I think unfortunately that sort of filtered through to. The powers to be. I don't think from the from the unit side of things, but we were literally um, packed and ready to go to hoot spray and jump on, um, get all the flower mice on to C one thirty going to Maseru or um, just the bordering town in, in in the Free State and then drive in. But um, pretty much packed up on the way, and they said no, stop, drop. You guys aren't going anymore. And I think it it sort of it's filtered through to to political level where. They were concerned that these guys are, would be trigger happy, and they're itching to go and um, and and maybe, um, yeah. I think they judged them to to, to be irresponsible, and um, yeah, they're all professional guys. I don't think they would have just gone and guns blazing and and kill everything that moved. No, I don't. I don't believe anything. But anyway, that was I think the perception, and um, so that was all stopped, and. Um, and needless to say, um, then the rest of the military, uh, including some of the um, parachute brigade and, and pathfinders, deployed um, based on military intelligence, not on own intelligence. 
and um, and I think that was the the first recipe for disaster. And there were no uh, not enough thought put into it on how to approach bases, uh, the military bases, etc. And as you know, Lesotho is is, is pretty. Um, it's hilly, but there's no there's no cover. There's not a lot of trees and stuff. So it's it's um, so to approach a base that's that's sitting on terraces and and you approach the base at the bottom of the terraces, you're already in a, in a position of of disadvantage. Whereas there's lots of ways to approach the base from the side, um, where the windows nothing face the sides, and um, and that's um, I'll probably come back to 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 that point where. Um, major brains sort of, you know, you, you, we sort of revisited all the areas where there was big stuff up and um, he sort of, he talked it through and, and, and sort of educated and, and uh, yeah, it made so much sense what he, what he, what he taught us all. But anyway, so yeah, there was a big disaster. A lot of guys unfortunately lost their lives and um, including my, my, my colleague, Yarnell, the other doc and um, one of the other seven mate guys, um, Corporal Sachs, and um, so this, the, the, this, the story there was they, they landed at Katze, Katze Dam. Um, so there were 12 fully armed guys um, in an Oryx. They landed there. And so only 12 of them. And they approached the base. And um, and like I said, no offense to, 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 to the Lesotho uh, military because, you know, if, if, if you hear the South African forces are on their way. So so the message is, yes, we, we, we're there to integrate sort of Say, boys, hey, don't, let's not pick up arms against your own. Never mind against us uh, integrating with you guys and do a bit of retraining. If that's not the message that actually those guys filtered through to them, so that's the message for the mili- for the South African military. But those guys weren't aware that that was really the message. All they knew was the South African military is on the way, and there's a helicopter landing with fu- um, twelve fully armed guys approaching the base. What are you going to do? You're not going to wait. You're going to you're going to fire the first shot. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so Katsidnam, they um, twelve guys. Uh, one one guy got injured in the leg, but they they actually successfully um, yeah outnumbered these guys. Well, they were totally outnumbered, um, and they they put up a, a a good fight, and they they killed quite a few guys there. And um, and in the second movement, going through the base, basically what happened? There was an injured guy in one of the um, dongas or compounds and um, he was sort of lying under the floorboards and um, he could hear the guys approaching so it was pretty much um, you know, um, room clearing and um, and Sax was he was standing in front of one of the doors and they were just about to, to bash it open and the guy inside heard the commotion he took one shot and he shot through the door and fatally wounded him um, and then Everybody uh, withdrew, and um, they got two LNGs, two hundred rounds each, so four hundred rounds into that specific building, and um, and then oh, they then they ran, grabbed um, Sachs, and pulled him to safety, um, and um, and then once they put the four hundred rounds through, um, they said to you on go check out Sachs, and he literally. Um, knelt next to him as he as he as he sat down next to him to to check him out the same guy shot through the um again the blind shot shot through the the um the wall um it's a temporary dwelling so a temporary building so it's not a brick building shot through there and he and he got him in between his flak jacket in the axilla basically and um yeah and he he died on top of sacks they were lying on top of each other like that and um but anyway so yeah that was a really unfortunate situation and um, so, obviously, the, we back at five in, in Balaboro, and then we heard of this big commotion, and then they said, okay, no, you guys are going again. And um, so off we went. By then, obviously, all the, the, the uh, big things happened. But, um, yeah, uh, for seven weeks, we, we sort of did lots of different um, – we, we drove all over the place and found a lot of um, stash weapons and – um, I'll probably won't tell all the details on 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 this because I don't know if it's um, might be uh, yeah might be issues with that because we weren't allowed certain things in Masiri at the airport, um, but we we managed to um, 
one night did a, did a um a sneaky and we got into a, a, a underground facility which is at Masira Airport and I can tell you this this facility was brand new and this can uh, that can probably house um I'm I'm talking uh, underground facility that's probably <laughs> I don't know if it's um nu nuclear uh, protected but I can tell you that this is a, a serious underground bunker where probably 200 plus people are we talking um sleeping quarters um kitchens and and uh, uh, you can a self sufficient underground facility where where quite a few hundred people can 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 live for for quite a while and um, and this was brand new so um and there was lots of weapons um not only in Masiri at the at the military base there uh, but at that military base and their airstrip there that underground bunker uh, there was a lot of stuff but i can i can tell you that that's all all weapons and things that has been stashed as part of the the struggle that was, was going to happen in south africa um and you know, if if things if the political climate didn't change i think that was all part of building that up um then other places in Masiri we drove and and um either with or flew with oryx and did some leapfrog um you know, short deployments checking caves and and um, sta um weapon stations things like that so we had we pretty much covered the whole Lesotho and um yeah no with no conflict really but um again but everywhere we went my your Jojo brains he said right boys he, in my series itself he, he said okay this is what happened here so how could this have been different and again just the, the approach um and on loudspeaker approaching a base where the guys can't take a clear shot at you they have to literally go out the window and shoot they, they can't even see you so you approach the base from the side or from the top there's heaps of um, areas to have approached the base with loudspeaker saying look we are not here to 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 cause any harm etc and and sort of continues and maybe get some representative have a talk and say boys right let's have a sit down and have a talk and that's pretty much what happened at other bases as as we went through the Sutu and we played soccer with the guys and had a good integration with them and um yeah bit of retraining with them and that was it um so um yeah so that's just pretty much my my, my story from a, from a military point of view um like I said after I was there 89 90, 90 98 99 um like I said, in, in my heart, it wasn't finished. I think after Yuan got shot, there was a bit of pressure from the family saying, geez, man, you, sw you, you studied for a long time. This is this is not even a, a, a local, this is not local um, conflicts that you're going to get yourself involved in. And is it really worth it? So anyway, so I decided, okay, to, to, to give it up. It's, um, it's one of those things, you know, uh, I suppose. I'm, I'm not sorry having met my wife, put it that way, but... Um, if um if things were different I, I would have gladly stayed at seven met because one of the the golden handshakes there if you do your time you can walk into any specialty and um, you don't have to stand in line um to to specialize if you want to specialize in something you still have to pass your exams of course but i think by then i the, the itch was out of my bum i could sit, sit down for a little bit longer so <laughs> but um but um yeah so when i left um yeah i i uh, didn't take me long to sort of start finding all my ex-military friends working all over the place. I started working in Mozambique um, more in a medical capacity, but some of the guys doing security work. So we always m met up somewhere in a work capacity. And um, and then from Mozambique, um, I, there was uh, one of my mates said, look, um, is, is they're looking for a doctor in Angola. Do you want to go there? And, and that was sort of a, I'm like, yep, I'm in. <laughs> so ended up um, living and working in Angola for four years and um, met a lot of ex-military guys there, which was a really, again, amazing time. Some some guys that, that, that's walked really um, deep spura in Wehrmacht yeah, for many, many years. And um, so, yeah, so we often had um, barbecue, a prize and, and, and lots of beer and drinking and um, socializing and and that that's where um, yeah we often went down south of, of uh, Queros. He was back in Angola by then, and um, so he was 
despite um, his involvement in the South African military, the, the special forces there gave him a piece of land um, south of Luanda. So it was one of our favorite things to do is to go down for a weekend and, and camp out at his place, little restaurant on the beach and um, lots of drinking, lots of seafood and lots of stories and lots of crazy things. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was uh, the other thing that was interesting with um, we integrated quite well with their, their current military guys there. There was sort of a, a social every first Sunday at the fort in, in Luanda. There was a bit of a get-together and a bit of a braai and a few beers and just sort of sitting down and talking. And it was always great listening to to some, some of the, the, the older guys um, that, like I said, it's, that, that, were, that were career soldiers and, um, uh, you know, one uh, ex um African Air Force pilot talking with this Cuban guy, and and they realized that they were in a in a in an air air battle together. Um, he was in the yeah he was in the MIG and he was in the Mirage, and uh, it just just sitting back looking at these guys, sort of discovering that that story together, and they sort of fill in the story with each other, and having a beer together and having something to eat together, and like I said, yeah, well. It wasn't what I expected. Um, there was a, a, a very a great mutual respect, actually, between the Angolan forces, um, current and ex, and all the basically ex South African for, um, military guys that worked in Angola. And um, so, yeah, that was that was that was something that, that sort of unexpected. But yeah, great times there. But um, yeah, like, uh, uh, like I said, I don't know if. My story is interesting enough <laughs> to to entertain some guys, but um, yeah, and I'll definitely uh, won't regret my my short stint there. Oh, I have to say to you, uh, fantastic story. I, I have a lot of questions. If you don't mind, I will start with a tricky one first. Now, your older brother, Doctor Jean Duplessis, told us that he was a damn good rugby player. True or false? <laughs> no, that's true. He's got he's got a um at administrators administrators beaker cup, that, and he's he's yeah. So um, that's yeah, that's a that's a special achievement. So yes. <laughs> so I okay, have to no, no, I, I thought he was telling the truth, but it's good to check. You know, it's not often <laughs> that we have brothers here. I recall when we recorded the career brews of uh, Frito Battalion. I started asking questions like always with, and the eldest one I think is Jan. He stopped right there. He said, "Quiz, I kiss the old the brewery round. I brought yesterday in the leister." <laughs> and I said, yeah, "Wrap up, <laughs> no problem." <laughs> but this brings me back to 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 Stellenbosch University. Now I was at Kofsis. Uh, Stellenbosch is known as a very good university. I just want to say that, especially the rugby team. I wouldn't want to think you guys went there just because of the rugby team, but. Um, that course is of yours. Does it still exist? Is it still still operating? Yes, as far as I know. Yeah. Indrach and um, Dagbreek, and that that was the two of the big rugby courses. So there was, um, I think, Volkenhof. One of the other ones were majority of, yeah, one of the other ones. I forgot the name now, but anyway, most of the the ex military guys went. The, the guys that finished them, the national service went there, but. Um, we de we had a, a handful of maybe five or ten guys in our course I there. Yeah, so so there were a lot of I suppose for officers they also from um, the military academy. Have you ever seen them? Because they would go there for for their studies as well as the boss, if I remember correctly, or the profs that, anyway. But you, so that's did you right. Yes, guys definitely. Um, I, I know specifically they were definitely there because I think they were from the um, I think it was from Langebon. That's where the I think the military academy was there. So yes, definitely saw some of those guys there. Um, I didn't have any of them in in Yendrach. I can't remember meeting any of them, but uh, I was aware that yeah that they, they did come study there. Yes. Now I want to know something. When you now like a like a roof or something, you just arrived in the army. But you're already a qualified man. I mean, you're a professional guy. I mean, you would have been nine years at university by that time if you'd done yes. your BSc and then your MB or CHB, you know, those yep. degrees. So you're not a child in, in any sense of the word. You're, you're a grown man. 
And then these, these instructors must obviously know you're a medical doctor, and that carries a certain prestige. Uh, so what do they call you? A uh, rough cop of, you know, the normal words, or do they more a bit more respectful, or they just don't care? <laughs> it was, um, well, look, we, we were uh, about 30 youngsters started with us, so we were sort of um, as part of a group. So they would they would just call you by your surname. Um, while you were a um, candidate officer, candidate officer, they, they would just call you by your surname. And uh, but only... Yeah, only after basic training, um, all the regimental stuff done and dusted, then you actually got your rank, which is a bit, which was funny because the shouting didn't stop and the screaming didn't stop, but they they addressed you as captain then, and uh, <laughs> because because of course the training carried on to to get you prepared for for yeah for 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 for, for bloom, and uh, but yeah, so once the basic training after that you could wear your rank and like I said then you were addressed by your rank, but. <laughs> it was a, it was a strange transition, I must say. Yes. <laughs> now, now as a medical man, do you understand your own body while you're running there doing a parachute uh, selection course and all the other selections? Do you understand what's going on in your body, or you just too tired and just carrying on, or, or get to yourself? That, that's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. Um. I I don't think I can't remember ever. Thinking that, um, like over analyzing what's happening in my body, other than I'm absolutely knackered, but um, just thinking that, look, uh, I always had the attitude, and I, I spoke to a guy actually before a lot of that. Uh, a friend of mine, he was, um, he was, um, in, in he's in the police and quite high up in the in the in the in the task, task mark and the task force, and um. And a lot of them also went to attempt to get their wings because they they often do um, jumps as well. But anyway, um, and he always said to me, "Just remember when you go, always surround yourself with positive people." He says because negativity will fester, and if if somebody starts complaining, and doesn't matter what you do and how many of it you have to do and how much they tell you and and of how much they they try to break you down, if somebody's negative. Just avoid them. Go go to other people that I either keep their mouth shut or say positive things. And um, and and that was a really useful tip. And the second thing I always thought to myself, I put myself in this situation. I chose to be here. Um, it wasn't I wasn't forced to come. I can leave anytime I want to. But why would I leave if uh, if I haven't achieved anything yet? And and the third thing that sort of really helped me was. And it was funny, and, and I must actually tell this as well. <laughs> I can remember one of the one of the in, uh, interrogations, you know, because you get caught and then you get interrogated, and it's not comfortable. It's um, it's not supposed to be comfortable, <laughs> but um, and I I remember one of the guys absolutely freaked out, and I thought to myself, you know what, sitting with a bag over your head, you're getting which is, you know, you get slapped around and. It's, it's a wet bag over your head. Your hands are tied behind your back. You're sitting in a very uncomfortable position for hours and hours. And um, there's loud music and you get pushed around. And anyway, and and, I, and, I, and that, that's the other thing. I always thought to myself, yeah, this is uncomfortable, but this must end. I don't know when, but this cannot go on forever. So that's the, that's another thing that sort of, sort of helped me mentally to sort of say, I chose to be here. This cannot last forever, and yeah, it's it's and this is not and and especially the interrogation part. This is not real. Nobody's going to blow my brains out suddenly, or you know, shoot me literally through the leg or something. You know, getting beaten up a little bit and and you know, almost suffocating. That that's that's okay. Nobody's going to kill you. They they can't kill you. They, they, they want to train you. So so this. But I remember one of the guys totally freaking out where they actually had to take it all off and take him outside and say, no, it's all okay, you know, relax. And um, needless to say, we didn't see him for much longer. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's uh, – <laughs> but anyway, that's that's some of the things I, um, I'll i never forget is to, to surround yourself with, with positive people and and just, you know, if things are really tough, just think, ah, this, this, this will end. Just don't know when. <laughs> Do you still feel like that when you work now as an experienced doctor? Do you still want the nurse and everybody around you to be like, 
man, we're going to do this. We, we, we will not start praying before we treat the guy. There's no need, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> well, from a, from endurance point of view, or, or uh, long hours, or, or, um, or well, from is, is treating the guy, from treating him. If you have a patient in front of you, is it better for you as a doctor to be positive, or <clears throat> yeah, sometimes or. It's, um, I, I tell you yeah, why yeah. I ask this all because I was told that uh, uh, I have some some legacy viewers in the US as well, and they say to me the doctors they will not, for whatever reason, give bad news. I don't know if they're scared of being sued or whatever, but they will not be as straightforward as a South African trained doctor and say to a guy, "Listen, you're too fat, man. You better get a, you know, lose some weight here. You're waiting <laughs> for for serious trouble, things like that." Um, that, that, that's what I mean by that. So, so this philosophy went with you yep. till to today. Yeah, I, absolutely. It's um, I, I I prefer to be direct, but not judgmental. Um, so to be diplomatic about, especially when it comes to to look about the the overweight size of things. It's um, yeah. There's there's no patients don't appreciate to be to be judged by that but but they sometimes need to know that that's not okay they need to do something about it um but um yeah like i said there's the more diplomatic ways of saying somebody's overweight and, and it's not good for their health rather than say look you're too fat and you're gonna die <laughs> okay no no i grant you that certain things cannot be said I have another question, you know, uh, a female asked me to ask the first guy, whoever we can get hold of, who has gone through the interrogation phases, the dog phases, and she wants to know what happens if you get like a nut, if you have to go to the toilet, but you're sitting there with your back over your head, and uh, what do you do? Do you just hold on, or do you say, well, let's go, let's just go? What What do you do? Uh, number one or number two? Well, both. <laughs> okay. No, number one is easy because you, you already normally you're fully wet by then anyway. So, because you know you, you don't want to pee your pants thinking that that making them think that you that you peeing your pants because you're scared. Um, so, so, but um, yeah, look, that's a good question. I've never thought about the number two part of it. It's um, yeah, it's it's. <laughs> Yeah, no, no idea what it, what what will happen. Is, um, really? I suppose if it's knows. in a training scenario, um, you know, they might they might accommodate you saying if you say, "Look, I really have." To. Look, to be honest with you, um, when when the, when the adrenaline's pumping, then it's not like a baboon, you know. When it, when when adrenaline, he, he gets a, a, a adrenaline rush, he normally shits his pants. But uh, I I find with with humans, it's it's sometimes the opposite. It's um, some people get uh, excited and nervous, and you know you get you get these times where you hear stories about people breaking into a place, and I think that adrenaline rush they actually, um, you know, they actually defecate somewhere. But um, I think in in a in in a in a stressed body situation um, of extreme exercise and things like that, I I can't remember ever having to put my hand up. And, Saying, oh, by the way, sorry, can I? <laughs> but um, I'm going to ask that question now for <laughs> some of my colleagues and say, have you ever come across this? Because now I'm also curious. <laughs> no, we would like to know. Um, it's an old friend of Legacy of a Legacy show, uh, SV4E, it's called 4 uh, former Sergeant Major Juan Reiki, explosives expert. And we wrote his book. And uh, in it, he admitted that he's the one who came out of this idea of using ice cold water to pour them over the poor recruits, you know, sitting there in a dark face and being abused in the nicest way possible. And I asked him, I said, Esther, and I asked this for RSM James Tate as well and a few others. I said, Do you people feel sorry for these lads who are sitting in front of you? Do you have any feelings of compassion? Because I've seen medics actually started crying there on behalf of a guy who was being abused. But even that is a damn trick to get him to talk. So have you ever been involved as a medical officer in these training things? And if you were, uh, tell me about it. Do you have any feelings of, of 
being nice to this guy or is it, man, you either fit in or you're going to die later down, down the road. It's not a joke. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know. Personally, um, no, I think, yeah, you know, being there, done it, you know, you must toughen up type thing. It's, um, <laughs> It's 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 tough shit. You know, that, that, that's part of it's part of it. It's part of it. You must, uh, yeah. Sorry, no, 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 no remorse. <laughs> no, well, that's coming from a doctor it doesn't sound it doesn't sound good coming from a doctor. But no, I've got. I've well, got no I understand. Remorse. I understand fully. <laughs> this 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 answer is very for you. Very good, mate. Actually, so so Skog said to me when when I said oh, I'm going to speak to a seven minute doctor, he says, well. He really has high respect for you guys. He said they worked with a doctor who were four months or even longer behind enemy lines, deep in Angola, and they had to take care of everything themselves. And he said the doctor was even trained as a um, dentist. So he could teach him who says we are for you as a dentist. He's only in the felt, you know, it's going to do this, do this, do that. Uh, how well, well were you guys equipped to work like this? Uh, did, did you ever need it, the right equipment? I remember your brother once said that there was a guy they tried to treat. There was something wrong with his head. His brain was swelling up. We had to drill a hole in his head. I'm sorry, I'm not speaking medical now. <laughs> but that's what happened. And and they were really not trying to do that. This, this was a bit more, more specialist than what they were at that stage. But they could do it. And they did save yes. his life. So were you guys well, well trained? Were you confident in yourself? I, yeah, abso absolutely. It's um, like I said. Um, I think for my um, on the on the background of, of my intern here, where it's so much trauma that uh, um, I, I was I was confident to to maybe maybe you know sometimes if you, the, the older you get, the the more, the the more scared you get, and um, or I'm not necessarily scared, but you know, as a young doctor, sometimes. What you don't know, you know, you, you, not that you think you know everything, but but you, it's almost your cowboy years. It's um, you know, you, you 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 can take on the world as long as you, you you've got some sort of medical knowledge. It's see one, do one, and um, or sort of yeah, I wasn't scared to take on anything um, procedural wise. It's um, because in in some situations, same with Jean and them, and that story that he told you about the brain bleed and they had to drain it. If you if you do nothing, the guy's gonna die. If you do something, there's a chance he can live. There's a there's a, there's still a good chance he's gonna die or have permanent brain damage. But um, but if you do, if you do nothing, he's definitely gonna die. And um, and and if you if you pro and a lot of the procedures like some um, like a hole in the heart, sometimes stab in the heart. You know, it's it's. There's, there's no time to phone, phone the surgeon and say, I've got a guy with a, um, they've got stabbed in the heart. If, if he's alive by the time you see him, he's not going to be alive for much longer. Um, and by the time you say, okay, hang on, boys, put some drips up and you know do all the supportive stuff that you typically would do, do your ABCs on, on supportive treatment. By the time you phone the surgeon and organize theater, by the time you get to theater, this guy's long dead. And, and if you don't do a thoracotomy, if you don't open his chest in the emergency department um, and put your finger in the hole, you can you can put your finger in the hole and pump pump the heart with the, the other hand until you go to theatre, until the surgeon can fix the hole. But if you don't plug that hole there, he's definitely dead. <laughs> There's no chance. He's got no chance. And um, so, yeah, so sometimes with some procedural stuff, when it comes to our, our medical bags, we were pretty well equipped, you know, the... Because with seven mate, you know, it, you have to jump with this bag, and um, so it's it it was an awesome bag. You know, it's it's um the way to pack it. So obviously, it doesn't make a noise when you have to carry it around, and and um and yeah, and the way to pack everything so it doesn't break. The instruments we had, and the medication. You know, there's 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 the wonder drug you always see on the American um some of the uh, American trauma stuff from from Afghanistan. You know, they're always whack in the intraosseous line or, or uh, um, intravenous line and, and they give the guys ketamine and with ketamine it's amazing drug because it's it's amazing for pain it knocks the guy out and you can you can amputate his leg under a tree if you have to um and it's it's not a 
a cocktail of different anesthetic drugs that you have to go and and do. So yeah, you can do with a good whack of ketamine. You're not going to kill the guy. It it maintains a good blood blood pressure, and um, so yeah, with if you've got enough ketamine, there's a lot, a lot of procedures you can do in in with very limited equipment and monitoring equipment and stuff like that. So yeah, and our bags were. I think well equipped. I'm, I'm not saying that John and them that, that the procedure that they had to do was that wasn't a quick under the tree scenario really. It was in um, Grootfontein in the theater, but um, that was the type of surgery which ends up on a neurosurgeon's table. And um, so for two young doctors, you know, the one having to do the anesthetic and the other one having to do the drill by using textbook and um, yeah, it wasn't today, you know, you can quickly look at an app or, or a medical app or something that can sort of assist you in certain things. Way back then they had to buy a phone, speak to the guy in one mill and the guy and he sort of talk you through the procedure. And um, so, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's great to, to get that opportunity. And, 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 and some, yeah, I, I still work in, in remote um, Australia in a, in a small um, hospital where you, it's only one doctor and, some of the stuff before the Royal Flying Doctors can come fetch a patient, um, you know, there's sometimes procedural stuff that you have to do that, like I said, if you do nothing, they, they're definitely going to die. And so and people say, oh, it's very daunting working there because what if you get a guy with a heart attack? You know, it is what it is. It's, um, I see it as an easy thing because um, in, a, in a perfect world, if you can get him around the corner to the big hospital and it can be in the in the cath lab under the supervision of a cardiologist within an hour, he's got a great chance of survival. If he's out here, I can only do certain medications and uh, supportive medications until he's flown out. And there's a long delay on that. And if he doesn't make that, that's not my fault. I can only do the best I can. I don't have a cath lab. I'm not a uh, cardiologist that can do those type of procedures which is done so so i see some um yeah uh, sometimes individual or, or remote type of doctoring not as a daunting thing because um you can only work to, to the limit of your skill on what you've got and and the rest you can't blame yourself for it's um but but at least if you can push your limits on 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 that skill at least you know you can feel good on what you did um, instead of saying, no, this is too hard, I'm not going to do it, scared of liability or whatever, sometimes you just have to <laughs> bite the bullet and do something. <laughs> yeah, no, I fully understand that. I, th I think one of the problems you as a doctor in, in Africa, anyway, uh, with face is this language. If you cannot quite understand what this patient is saying to you, uh, so, do would you have translators with you all the time, or or would you pick up the vital signs from the body, or both? Uh, how did you guys overcome yeah. this? Um, are you talking the military sense, or um, in in private um, small places? Yeah, both. If it's uh, both, because yeah. you can talk on both of us. So I'm I'm fascinated to hear how a doctor knows what's actually wrong with this person. Um, for example, when I when I went to Angola for the four years, um, the first part of Portuguese I, I learned was my, was my trade. So, you know, how do you feel? Um, where's the pain? Um, you know, how, how many days? So you can ask all the medical questions. How do you take your tablets? And, you know, open your mouth. You know, okay, check your ears. And, yeah, so breathe in, breathe out. And um, so so that's, that's probably the first thing you, you sort of... <laughs> I don't know. That that was the easiest part to, to to sort of learn your trade, and then you sort of branch out from there to start to start talking socially. But um, other other places where I've worked um, in Africa, yeah, if you, if, you, if it's pretty new and you didn't have a chance to do that yet, then you get a translator or or you or you or you demonstrate. If somebody you can sort of show somebody to open their mouth and and. Um, Sort of mime certain certain movements or whatever, and and like, as you say, vital signs is is important. But when it comes to to if it's trauma, it's it's, it's probably much easier um, because trauma is trauma because you can you basically go through ABCs and, and treat the patient um, in a systematic way, and you can examine them in a systematic way. But if somebody comes with a complicated um, medical history, that that much that obviously that's much harder because you have to sort of tease out certain things from a history that, that will 
steer in a, in a direction of what type of illness. But um, yeah, so th that's that's obviously much harder if you don't if you can't communicate if you can't communicate with them. But um, yeah, translators is probably the easiest. I just want to say, uh, I mean, when South African forces deploy in DRC and other places in Africa in the in the new army, as as my generation would refer to it. It came out in research. I did this research myself. I was writing a few books and I actually did the research. And it came out that the South African Army Medical, the people there, all of them, Air Force, whatever, had a much better uh, disciplinary record than the French Army, which was just flipping amazing for me to hear. Because a lot of people, you know, is always like very negative, blah, blah, blah. I've got the evidence. I've seen it. Uh, there's very, very few cases of child molesting or, you know, the normal crack which you find where you find you in forces, things like, things like that. <clears throat> Is there a, some kind of a perplichtum? What's that in English? Uh, a duty. Is there a duty upon you to, to report anything you see and you find suspicious that you have to report this? And I'm talking now as a military doctor. I know as a civilian doctor, you do have such uh, implemented by law onto you, depending on where you are and which country. You have to act if you see certain things. If a child is being abused, things like that, you have to report it in many, many countries. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not being a spy or anything. Damn, it's a human being which is in, in assistance, need, needs assistance. But as a military doctor, um, is there any, any uh, type of duty on you to to report anything which you might find is perhaps a war crime? That's a really good question, because um, I can't recall specifically being um, informed about that. I, I, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but um, I think I probably what I, what I would have done is, is, of course, discuss it with, with colleagues first and um, sort of, and say, well, what do we do? But um, I can't remember a specific, um, well, the, the typical medical, um, military process on, on who you report to in, in the chain of, of, of commands. But um, I can't specifically remember being educated or trained on that. No. When you are at a place like Five Reiki, which is in those days became a premier special force unit, um, one Reiki became a training unit. Five became the one, still the biggest one existing to this day, to be found right across Africa. God knows what they're doing, and we don't want to know. And uh, I don't want you people to speculate either. Um, they're doing good work. It is just yesterday I read a newspaper article about some police colonel of a Hawks who got himself killed. He was shot dead in South Africa. He was investigating a few things. And uh, they noticed some vehicle close by, which they think belonged to South African Special Forces. So now immediately people start jumping to the conclusions that uh, Five Reiki has murdered this, this colonel. It's the biggest bullshit I've ever heard in my life. And I speak as a policeman attorney, as well as somebody who actually worked in the shadows. I know all these heats are done. Don't jump to conclusions. That's what I'm trying to, to say to people. You know, stop that nonsense. My question to you, when you're at Five Reiki, places like that, what are you? Are you an operator first or are you a doctor first or are you both at the same time? How does that work in your brain? How do you think of yourself? So when I, when I was there, um, I, was, I didn't formally work as a doctor at all. Um, they at one stage thought, uh, because they had, they had medical facilities on site where there were nurses and, and visiting doctors. Um, and at some stage, if nothing happened for a while, I sort of asked them, "Yeah, so we can run a, I can run a little clinic for them in the mornings or something like that." But, um, but the main, yeah, mainly as a soldier first, really, and um, and then and then as a doctor. <clears throat> okay, may I ask you, what's the best excuse a troop ever gave you for anything? Probably, I, I can't remember the, um, well, not to do something, to, to try and get out of something. <laughs> Jeez. 
look, I, to be honest with you, like I said, I, I can't remember doing a lot of medical work in, in the army. So I, I can't recall a story, but but I can tell a story that I've heard, which um, from one of the, the, the seven med doctors, you know, everybody got stuck in the mess one night. And, and um, as you do on, you know, on an occasion, and there was a lot of drinking and, I think two o'clock in the morning, one of the one of the troops knocked on his on his on his door and said, oh, doc, I've got the worst headache. Please just give me something." And um, and obviously knowing that he was one of the big instigators for getting this party going that night, and he thought, "Why would you wake me up two or three o'clock in the morning for some Panadol? You know, it's something yeah, it's on a self inflicted headache." And there's I suppose you can't do it these days, but one of the things we use for angina, which is a little spray under the tongue. And uh, so when you spray it on the tongue, it works pretty quickly. So a guy gets a chest pain, you spray it on the tongue. Basically what the medicine does, it dilates the blood vessels of the of the heart to sort of you know, un, you know, to, to increase the blood flow there. But it also dilates some blood vessels in your head. So one of the big side effects, it's called uh, night... Um, nitroglycerine so it's um and that is a spray it's it's same stuff you get in, in in dynamite and and you know guys that work with with explosive and dynamite often tell you they got headaches from them uh, from that so anyway so this stuff so so what the doctor decided instead of giving him two panadol he gave him two sprays under the tongue of this stuff needless to say his headache doubled within seconds and um and the guy said oh, oh my head wants to explode and he says well, next time when you've got a headache like that, then you can knock, and then you can knock on my door. <laughs> so, um, mm, yeah. So I think really it's um, <laughs> that's it. That's a type of story I like because <laughs> it's uh, um, because yeah, you, you sort of get away with um, <laughs> I wouldn't say medical negligence, but um, you know, today if you, if you give somebody nitroglycerine and in, in, for for the wrong reason, you can probably get charged. For some medical thing, but of course you know it's not gonna damage the guy. It's uh, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, this this uh, times have changed. I have to say, I don't always know for if it's for the better or for the worse. Internet, we are here at the end, and I must tell you, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, speaking uh, to Doctor Shoulder Percy. And I have to ask him now, uh, Doctor, do you have any message for any of your uh, friends, comrades, people watching here? Have anything to say to them, perhaps? Yes, because well, thank you, thank you again for for the opportunity to be interviewed by you and to, for me to tell my story. Um, a lot of my colleagues and friends that some I've, I've still got contact with, and obviously some of you guys, not. Um, I just want to say that I've got fond memories of all of you guys. I hope you're all well, and whatever you do in the world, you know, uh, I know you, you guys will make the best of it. And I hope that more of you will come on the show because there's um, lots of stories to be heard from all of you. Thank you. And now I want to ask all of you, yeah, legacy, uh, gentlemen, shall we bow our heads just for one minute of silence for Dr. Johan Nell and Corporal Sachs? who fulfilled the highest traditions of 7 Medical Battalion. In fact, there was somebody before them who got captured by the what we call terrorists in the old days in Angola. And he was tortured most brutally to betray his, uh, his unit. He did not do so, and by not doing so, he saved their lives. Uh, he was decorated for bravery, as were these two as well, uh, Dr. Nell. So I'm asking you that we just bow our heads for, for one minute. I cannot play the last steps here because if I do, this YouTube people will then flag our video and say that uh, we are playing uh, copyrighted music or something, even though it's been played since 1743. But uh, I'm tired of that argument with them. So let us just bow our heads for one minute.
Hy woon net die laaste vraag praat, daai, daai het hy na met goed, uh, wat jylle spuit in die huis en jys wat sy kop kan erger seer kry. Het dit die effect op die onderste gedeelte van sy uh, voortplanting oorgaan, sal die ook nou geaffecteer word, dat hy nie kan uh, gevong in sy dronk toestand, of het dit geen effect nie, is dit nee, net vir die hart? Ja, dit, dit maak maar die hart aard een bykie open, en, um, ja, ja, en, 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 en geef jou kop seer, en, uh, maar, um, Ja, dit het nie effect op die rest, al gelukkig nie. Okay, al gelukkig, nee, nee, al gelukkig, nee, nee, al gelukkig, daar gaan we. Ek het dit vanochtend, daar is van haar triekie, so van ek nie weet nie. Ja, dit is een algemeen ding, jy krijg, jy krijg dit een pilletje vorm op, so, ons het met die haarprobleem, en dan sê, ja, sê, dan 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 sê, ja, met die tijd, dan sê, 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 dan Hy, die, 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 die swat ook, of die, die, die um, taak mag ook, wat vriend van my, yeah. um, of ook wat ek ken, wat, wat, hy, hy het gesê, door die tijd, en toe, toe hy, um, man, wat was het, daar was, daar was, daar was, a, a, a ska, a, 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 a poging tot a skaking gewees, um, in, by die lichaam, aan Jan Smits, dus ek denk, is nie, 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 en dan ja, verkeer, dat maar as het daar is wat een vliegtuig wil skaak, en um, toet hy blijkbaar um, nou gesê wat hy nou alles wil hee, en weet, die, die, die taak mag was, was betrokken daar so, en hy het gesê, nee, die oud blaftalkie, weet hy, hy het gesê nie, hy klomp dan met om sy lijf, en hy, hy gaan alle, die vliegtuig en al die mense opblaas, en al die ding, en allemaal het half weer gesê, weet, blaf hy, blaf hy nie, weet, en um, toe, toe, een van die goeders wat hy toe vraag, anders dan as nou kos en, en, uit die kos en water wil, wat ook al, toe vraai vir kopseerpille. Ja, en, uh, okay, ja, en toe sê daar manne, ja, toe sê hulle wel, ons moet, hy moet pas, pas op, dit, dit, dit is hmm. dalk, hy het ook rechtig dit nou met ons al, dit is ook om die kopseer gekry het. Nee. En, uh, en die koot, koot kan sweet, jy weet, hulle begin sweet van ouderdom, en dan kan jy reik om, soos amandels, uit die, 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 die ja. reek. Ek het het enkele gespaal en reik in een kar, En, maar daar is niks binnen om nie, want ek krijg ons die honde, en ons het die ding gehad, daar die, daar is hier nog van die stofstuiers in naam, Kirby, Kirby systeem, ja. en wat ons bedoen het met hom, is ons suig hy licht dier, dier so'n filter, suig ons die licht uit die kar uit, vir so'n vijf minuut, en ons ja. het ons het neer, dan kom die honde, en die hond tel hom op, hy tel hy atome op, nee. wat aan daar vast is, en dan kak hy ook, want ons wil weet, waar is hy springstof, hy beter, ons baie mooi verduid yes. maar, uh, ongelooflik, he? is het, so nie, is een wijs slim plan, want die concentreer het, moest in hy vol trak, en die honderd, ja, yes, ja, ek kan al blijf, tot, tot so, tot so twee weke, en dan kaar so boot, yes. uh, sal hy daar blij, um, ons tel het op, snap so nog, maar wat, wat hy nie kan optel nie, was, was plastische springstof, het nie, uh, het nie reek nie, tot so 1990, toe die, toe die ouwens, begin om chemikalie in te sê, dat die hond om wel kan optel, En dis die neekry waarmee ons sit in Libya op die oomlik. Toe Libya ongeval is en, en Gaddafi verweider is, is daar iets ja. as 48 ton plastische springstof het verdwijn. En so ver ons kon vaststel, was dit allemaal pre-1990 springstof. So dit kan nie getruist word nie. En dit is die springstof wat net een jaar tevoor, of twee jaar tevoor een lokker bij afgeskiet het. En wat interessant yes. is van Lockerbie is, daar was 33 ons springstof, om 32 kilo's, die hele vliegtuig afgebring, en Pik Bota was van ons stel om een baie vliegtuig te wees. So tot vandag weet ons nie of die aanval iets te doen gehad het daarmee nie. Uh, baie interessant die goed. Maar, anyway, yes. groot te veel. Ja, nee, de, de, wel, 48 ton springstof, en wie sê, weet, dit, dit, wat, dit, dit wat uh, 1 of 2 kilogram om een vliegtuig, 7, 4, 7, Ja, het net 2 kilogram nodig. In feit, daar het 8 kilogram TNT afgegaan op een passagierskip in die Filipijne en hulle is kip gesank. Dit is die rekord so ver ek weet. 8 kilogram TNT wat versteek was in die TV. En het is kip gesank. Ok, hulle het nie oordentelike brandbestrijding gedoen nie, hulle moet dit nou wees hee. Maar die feit is, dit was iets as 8000 tot 12000 ton kip is gesank as gevoerd, sê, hy goed is gevaar ook nie, maar, uh, anyway, maar ek neem aan, jylle ons in Australië het ook te doen daarmee, ek neem, daar is baie myne en goed, en daar is sekerlik, ja. 
Ek wens wat maar begin snaaks raak nie dit. Ek wens wat wel, maar anyway, ons kan nou heel nog hier sit en praat, maar my vrou sê ek moet kom jyk. <laughs>